Great. So, um, hi everyone. Thanks for joining today's seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory. I'm your host, Pai, and our guest speaker for today is Jan Guggenheimer, who is currently an assistant professor for computer science at Telecom Paris. So his research interest is on nomadic virtual reality and the harmful impacts of um, mixed reality technologies. The title of his talk is Ubiquitous Mixed Reality, uh, Designing Mixed Reality Technology to Fit into the Fabric of Our Daily Lives, which is about two perspectives in AR VR research. Um, one of it is about how to improve the technology and the other is about how to challenge the positive perspective of it, of it as well. So the talk will be about an hour and then later on we will have a brief Q&A session. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Yan. Thanks a lot, Pai. Let me start with uh, my screen share. Good. So can you see my video, uh, my um, uh, my slides? Yep. Text looks a little bit blurry, but I think we'll, we'll make do. Okay, I try to. I try to get through this. Okay. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to start by um, introducing a little bit. So we talked with Pai already a little bit about the structures and the school here that I'm at. And I'm starting to talk a little bit about me and introduce me quickly. So my name is Anne Guggenheim, and I'm a, uh, so the, the title in France is Maître Conference, which is uh, more or less an equivalent of an assistant professor. Um, and I'm working at um, Telecom Paris at the intersection of um, human computer interaction and mixed reality. And I'm going to explain this a little bit um, more um, in, the, in the following talk. And uh, my background is, so I did my PhD at Ulm University in Germany. And during the PhD, I also spent um, a few months at uh, different research labs, uh, for instance, at the MIT Media Lab or at, um, MSR in Redmond. And um, so the school that I'm at, um, Telecom Paris, I just want to explain a little bit the amount of affiliations that I'm putting there and um, kind of remove some of the confusions I think that people have. So Telecom Paris is a, um, it's, a it's, it's called a kind of call in Paris, it's an engineering school. And it's nothing related to the company Telecom, it's just a name um, by uh, I think, coincidence, let's say. And it's actually a school that was founded in 1878 as the school for um, telegraphy. And over the years, the school itself, it's uh, changed its names. Um, and uh, I think I, I didn't even cover all of the name changes because there were quite some in between. Um, but I think the larger one that happened in 1954, um, um, where the name of the school was changed to um, École Nationale Supérieure de Telecommunication. And this is where the telecommunication part came from. So it was the school for telecommunication. And I think in fact, it was, um, so the term telecommunication was actually something that was um, invented or created at the school um, back then. And this is what like was left over later on. And this is where the name came, Telecom Par uh, Paris Tech in 2008. This is where they changed the name again. And most recently, um, the so in, in let me change this one. Oh yeah, in 2020, the school like moved. It was originally in the center of Paris and now it's moved a little bit outside to Palaiso. And um, this is also when I started actually my position at Telecom Paris, it was in 2020. And um, in 2020, it also moved to this new uh, wonderful building and it um, combined itself or it uh, created this larger construct together with four other engineering schools. And um, we called Polytechnique, Ensta, Ensa and Telecom Sud Paris. And all five of these schools, they all are engineering schools. And all five of these schools are created now this larger construct that they call Institut Polytechnique de Paris or IP Paris in short. So this is why I have like these amount of affiliations that I have to um, go through every time. And um, the school itself, just to explain a little bit the, um, the structure there, <laughs> the school itself is an engineering school where um, we have roughly um, 800 um, engineering students. Um, 220 PhD students and 500 master students. So it's, it's a uh, quite small school in the sense. It has 1,500 um, students. And I think it has roughly, um, I would even say 160 or 200 faculty uh, members. So the, um, the key between like how many um, students come on one teacher is actually a low one, which the school is actually quite um, proud of to have like this, um, let's say more intense teaching and research aspect. Um, so in, inside of this school, Telecom Paris, I'm working inside of the group, um, the, the DIVA group, which is led by um, Professor Eric Le Colline. And it's a group focusing on design attraction and visualizations. And um, inside of this group, I'm actually representing the uh, mixed reality aspect. So the HCI and mixed reality combination. And we currently have um, eight permanent members um, from visualization research, from um, psychology, for instance, Yves Guy is a psychologist, but also from design. So Sam Horan and Annie Gent are um, design 
uh, professors is also part of the dealer group. So it's quite an interesting uh, mix of people that are um, combined um, within the group. And we currently have two postdoc students, uh, five PhDs, um, but we are in the phase of growing. So I think um, hopefully soon we can um, I can present a few new members of the um, of the Diva group. So this is a little bit just um, for the background. So this is the school that I'm um, currently um, working at. And um, now I want to go to the topic um, that I actually presented, which are called um, ubiquitous mixed reality. And um, I think if if I would um, like present myself, I would consider myself more of an um, HCI researcher that is interested in or worked uh, is working within the field of mixed reality and not a mixed reality researcher that is interested in HCI. <laughs> That's why um, when I present the research um, or when I present this perspective that I talk about, I always start with this with this image, the traditional, or let's say the most basic um, model for um, human computer interaction where we have a human and we have a computer in some form and uh, between both of them, some interaction arises or um, occurs. And um, if we look at the shape of computing, so when we look over um, the, the time, and here I use the example of Mark Weiser that was talking about the waves of computing, um, we can see that the computer itself um, or the shape of the computing is actually changing over time. So we had a phase of mainframe computing at one point, and um, then we are starting to have like the phase of personal computing, to some degree mobile computing, and um, in the particular strain of HCI research that I'm involved in, um, people are starting or trying to look a little bit forward and, see, and try to see, okay, what is going to be um, the next dominant platform um, that we're going to use to access digital information? And one of the trends that we're going to see or that we are constantly seeing with this is um, the technology itself is um, coming closer to um, us humans. So I think most of the people that are also like um, at Mark's group or just within the talk here uh, would also share this um, this notion that one of the assumptions what could be a next dominant platform is some form of augmented reality, mixed reality, whatever reality we want to call it, XR, um, head-mounted displays, or some form of um, like goggles. I had, I had really generic, I tried to put a really generic image here of glasses. And, um, the, and there's actually an alternative, or not alternative, but there's also um, a field of research talking about human augmentation um, that are arguing that um, one of the next things is probably going to be something where um, we, like the human side, is going to change. We're going to have some human augmentation or um, some um, fusion or combination of technology and humanity. But what I want to kind of get at is that um, this shape of this tech is actually not that relevant because what is more interesting is the underlying paradigm that we're going to use. And I try to use the term um, spatial computing to kind of define this general paradigm that I'm, I'm going to talk about. And here again, if we look at this image again, um, the most dominant paradigm that we used for mainframe computing were command line interfaces. For smartphones and for um, personal computers, we use graphical user interfaces. And the argumentation is that for spatial computing, we will have something different, right? For augmented reality, virtual reality. And here it does not matter if this mixed reality is created through a pair of glasses or if it's created through a contact lens or if it's created through some form of, um, I don't know, augmentation of my eyeball, um, the underlying paradigm is going to be a similar one because it's going to work under this um, idea of being able to alter and change the environment to some degree that we want. So to visualize this again, I'm trying to show the, the, the current way that we are accessing or dominantly accessing technologies. We have digital technology kind of inside of this, well, pixel prison, or at least this is how Hiroshi Ishii is calling it, um, where he has this fight against the pixel empire. Um, but the, I, I kind of share this idea that most of, uh, most of the digital information we have is inside of a certain pixel prison. And this concept of um, ubiquitous mixed reality or spatial computing is that we will be able to change and alter the environment around us and add some form of digital um, information, augmented with digital information, but also be able to kind of go through the whole spectrum of the reality with reality continuum. So being able to completely mesh the physical environment um, and having something like virtual reality, but also only to partially augment some parts, have something like augmented reality and everything in between. 
so this is a little bit this this idea of ubiquitous mixed reality um, using the paradigm of spatial computing here. And yes, all, everything between like augmented reality, augmented virtual reality, and having all these fights about these little definitions, but at the end, having one system to some degree that is able to provide this all. And if you look at this, um, one of the questions is, is how, how, how can we get to this point, right? How can we get to this ubiquitous mixed reality that we have technology, like everyday usable, some form of um, um, visual augmentation um, device, and one thing that we can do is we can have a look at the progress of technology that showed before, right? So what changed from mainframe computing to personal computing? What changed from personal computing to mobile computing? And one of the big uh, parts that changed was actually the context of usage, right? So we changed from mainframe to personal, like the stationary context changed. Like mainframe computers were somewhere in dedicated spots. And now we had like, um, with personal computing, we have the ability to have computing in our homes. And from personal to mobile computing, again, the context of use change. Now we have access to digital information everywhere where we go, right, at our fingertips. So, and here, well, we can draw a little bit of a parallel, right? So we can have a look at, um, and here I'm gonna use VR, but the, a, similar, a similar notion can be done with augmented reality. And we can argue that something like cave systems are a little bit like mainframe computing, right? They were somewhere in a dedicated spot, but not at people's home. And with the current rise of personal virtual reality devices, such as the HSC Vive or the Oculus Rift, uh, we actually have now a phase of personal virtual reality, right? We have VR in our homes to some degree. And um, the question is now, how is mobile VR going to look like? And this was actually something where I was writing my dissertation in. And I called this interaction scenario actually nomadic VR. And I'm going to explain it in a sec what nomadic VR is. Um, but I also want to argue quickly that I feel that the Oculus Quest, as much as I like love this device, it's such it's, it's it's a wonderful piece of hardware. But I would still argue that the Oculus Quest is actually something like a personal computer that we take with us. My argument would be that this technology is currently not fully adapted to the context, and I'm going to show in the next um, in the next project I'm going to talk about uh, what I mean with that. What is what is currently missing here? So. Um, so the topic of my dissertation, I'm going to start a little bit with my dissertation and then go to um, other projects I was working on afterwards. Um, the topic of my dissertation was nomadic virtual reality, uh, focusing on overcoming challenges of mobile VR and And um, I'm going to show this method slide because I'm going to go back to it later on again. And just to give you a little bit of an um, understanding from what perspective I come to this um, type of research. And the methodology that I apply in all the projects I'm going to show you um, in, the, in the next slides is, is mainly following this path of having, um, starting with some form of um, a research question that addresses either problem that we see or tries to um, address a potential opportunity. And um, then there is the step of um, designing and implementing some form of artifact, software hardware artifact going through an empirical evaluation. So trying to understand like this, the system that we build, um, how does it work, right? Does it solve the problem that we have or um, does it actually um, provide some benefits with the opportunity that we found? And then the third step is kind of exploring and um, trying to show, okay, now we have the system, we know how it works and this is what we can do with it, right? So it's kind of exploring the potential design space either in a structural form or sometimes just through point designs, implementing some applications and that actually, um, yeah, trying to show like what is the advantage of this particular system. Um, so coming back quickly to the notion of nomadic VR. So the way that I define nomadic VR is it's a stationary interaction scenario in which a user is immersing oneself in a virtual environment using a mobile VR HMD inside an unknown context. It can be public context, it can be a social context. And the reason why I called it nomadic VR, not mobile VR, is, is mainly because um, the argument that is that with virtual reality, with pure virtual reality, we are actually not going to be able to have a mobile interaction. So being able to walk through the whole world. My argument would be that for this, we would need to include some form of the physical environment, making it not purely VR anymore, but something like augmented virtual reality. So I think it's a, it's a little bit definitional um, aspect, um, but this was the main reason. So the argument would be that the Oculus Quest is a, is a nomadic VR HMD, a perfect nomadic VR HMD. I can go with it somewhere, I can set up my boundary and I can interact there, but I cannot walk through the whole world with it, right? 
And for this particular nomadic village, um, I started to um, um, to set up this little um, like traditional HCI cycle, so to say. Right, we have a user, and we have uh, the user wants to interact with the virtual environment. We have this input and output cycle, right? We have some input um, from the user and some feedback from the system, and all of this happens now in a new context, right? Because we do not know where the user is immersing. And we do not know um, how this context is actually uh, impacting the world. And this context is actually impacting everything. It's also impacting the input, and it's also impacting the feedback, like the output of the system. We're going to show this in a second how. So for instance, the input, how it's impacted by the context, is when you are trying to use a VR HMD now in a, I don't know, in a public space or in a confined space, like in the back, back of a bus or in a train, you will realize that you cannot interact with white gestures. Or you do not want to interact with white gestures because um, you do not know who is currently in the environment. You want to bump into things or bump into people. So one of the first projects that we did in this field is we tried to see is can we design interactions that are using less space and are not forcing you to bring um, with you some form of um, um, some form of additional controller. And the first system that we built here was um, we called FaceTouch. And um, the core idea behind FaceTouch is we said we wanted to leverage the backside of the HMD as a touch sensitive surface. And we um, implemented several variations of this um, system. And we run, I think we ran three studies, but in a paper we reported two experiments that we did. So we run Fitz Law style experiments. So we, we were interested in to see how, like how precise are people able to interact on the back of the HMD, what type of um, selection techniques should we implement? And for instance, what size should certain buttons be that we can actually um, deploy? And then the third step, we started, so when we, when we were able to calculate the sizes of the specific targets, we could then start designing actual applications for this. And one of the example um, applications that we had were, for instance, we were we had a little shooter game, we are controlling this crosshair, and we um, also were actually able to have some text input. And in the study that we run, we actually compared uh, different mounting positions as well. So you can see in this video, let me pause this. Um, in this video, you can see that we had also a touchpad on the side, and we had also a touchpad in the hand. And we actually compared all three of them, and we were able to find that the back of the HD was still significantly better in terms of um, accuracy compared to a controller we have in the hands or on the back of uh, on the side. Um, and I think the explanation that we had is that um, through the proprioceptive sense, we're actually quite good in our facial region. So without looking, I'm able to find my nose, my eyes, and my ears, because I have a rough spatial understanding of my, um, of my facial area. So um, this was the, the input part, right? And um, or this was, for instance, how we argued input could maybe be adapted to work within this nomadic um, interaction scenario. And we also um, try to explore of what type of haptic feedback is currently lacking in uh, mobile or nomadic VR or mobile VR HMDs inside this nomadic interaction scenario. And uh, what we addressed here with the system gyro VR was kinesthetic feedback. So it's the feedback that we not perceive. So it's not continuous perceived through our skin, but it's actually feedback that we perceive through muscles and tendons. And what we built here was a flywheel on the back of an HMD. And with this flywheel, we were actually able to control the resistance. So we were able to control how difficult it is for a user to look around. And um, the way that we do this is mainly through if we are um, increasing the speed of the rotation of the flywheel and the user tries to break out of the rotational axis, um, he will perceive a, um, a resistive force here. And again, we went through a similar process here, right? We um, had some variations or some iterations of the artifact. I think one of the first systems um, that I built um, was running with three flywheels until I realized, wait a minute, I actually just need one, right? So I don't need, um, uh, one is enough to address two axes, right? The yaw and the pitch and the roll action is actually not addressed with this type of um, setup that we have, but it was not necessary for, um, or it's not that often used in VR, let's say. And one of the wonderful, or one of my favorite application scenarios, I have to say, is um, when we applied this in, a, you know, let, let's say, shooter-based game. So in every, uh, I don't know, 3D shooter that you know, you have something like a health bar. And usually, um, this health bar is something that you just have a, as a number, right? So it's like, oh, you have 100 health, and then you fall down to 60, 50, or 40. And um, with this system, we were able to make you feel 
this health, right? So you will feel if you're at the lower health, you will feel, oh no, it's 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 more difficult to um, look around and to move. So it's it's actually a nice um, type of um, um, additional feedback here. And the main argumentation or like why it fits so nicely into this nomadic VR interaction scenario is because it's completely ungrounded. Right, so it's kinesthetic feedback, where we do not need to have a system that is kind of positioned or grounded in, in, in the environment. We can do this mainly through this mobile um, uh, mobile setup that we have. So this is a type of, for instance, output or new type of feedback that can arise within this new um, interaction scenario. And I also had a look at the um, context um, part um, where I divided the context into um, human factors and physical environment, which is actually um, adapted by Schmidt et al. Also, the model is an adaptation of one of the works of um, Albert Schmidt. And um, he divided uh, the context into human factors and physical environment. And i uh, only going to quickly talk a little bit about one project that we did within the physical environment. So this means that we wanted to see, okay, um, if we're going to use VR now everywhere where we want, we could also use it inside of a moving environment, for instance, inside of a car. And um, with the system that we have, I think even right now, it's uh, something that is tricky and does not completely work because the problem is that when you use, and here's the setup that we had, we used in um, Samsung Gear VR back then. And um, if you will use the Samsung Gear VR inside of a car, um, you will actually, um, the forces of the car will mess or the orientation of the car will mess with your internal IMU. That's why we designed a system that used an um, external IMU inside of the car to get the rotation of the car. And we used an OBD2 reader to actually read the speed and acceleration of the car. And we used this to fuse inside of a virtual environment to actually show um, uh, or to actually kind of um, counter these, um, these forces of the car itself and enable the user to um, um, yeah, experience such reality inside of a, um, a moving environment. Um, so I'm not going to go into depth in these um, these projects because I, um, I'm happy to talk a little bit later if some are interested about these particular works. Uh, but I want to focus on something um, that uh, we started to work later on. So these projects here, um, they were all kind of part of my dissertation thesis, and this, this they all kind of worked um, or kind of presented this this um, yeah the space of nomadic VR, so to say. And the human factors are going to uh, present in a second in, in three additional projects. Um, but after this dissertation, I continue to work within this field, right? So I can continue to do more research about um, what type of, um, for instance, how does input change if we are in a, um, a non-stationary environment? What type of additional feedback can we create? And how does um, the whole like uh, physical environment impact the, um, the, uh, the interaction that we have um, with HMDs? But what I started more recently was I started to explore also to what degree this technology um, is um, impacting the um, the people, right? Is impacting the user itself, and this is something that um, I started to get more fond of and more interested in. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about the particular perspective here. So um, these created these three pillars of um, of research that I'm um, actually involved in that I'm doing. So two of them on the right side, the interaction with mixed reality and the context of use of mixed reality. They are both kind of um, let's say, shaping or explaining the technology. And on the left hand, we have this impact of mixed reality on the user. Um, so trying to understand, OK, what um, what particular implications do, um, do does the technology or does some of the technology design have on the user? And I'm going to talk about this part in um, or this particular pillar in, in the second part of the talk. So first, I want to focus on this on this two sides, because the research question here that we have is um, we're trying to ask ourselves, how can we shape and design this technology to create a desirable, usable, and pleasant system, right, to um, and pleasant interaction concepts and um, for ubiquitous mixed reality, right, for this future where we will have always available, always accessible mixed reality technology, right? How can we shape this? How can we create this desirable thing? And um, to demonstrate like one particular thing that I mentioned before as well, why I think that the Oculus Quest is currently um, a personal computer that we carry around for this, and it's not a pure mobile VR HMD, is because it's currently missing one of the, or not, not completely addressing one of the inherent issues I would argue for a mixed reality or virtual reality technology, which is um, asymmetric collocated interaction. And this is a line of work um, that I started in my PhD and we continued with colleagues later on as well. 
And um, it's, it's asked itself the core question of, if we're going to use um, a mixed reality, so on a virtual reality HMD or augmented reality HMD inside of a public space, and there are people around me, right? Um, if I'm going to use the or wear the VR HMD, currently no one, or it's starting to get something, but uh, the people in the environment are struggling to be part of this virtual experience and understand what's going on. Um, and one of the first projects that we did here um, was in, I think, 2016. Uh, we call it Share VR. And the core idea was um, we wanted to build an, uh, a, a VR system that allows the people without an HMD in the environment to still be part of this virtual world. So we used a top down. We actually had two projectors that we aligned to each other. Um, everything was running inside of a um, HCC um, Vive. So the projector is actually showing the whole HCC Vive environment. And we also had uh, a tracked um, uh, attract display on one of the Vive controllers. And this allowed me, for instance, to be able to interact and play with um, Julian, um, here my colleague. And um, uh, the, we, we actually ran two experiments with this. And I'm only going to talk quickly about one of them um, because our main goal was we wanted to include the people in the environment. And our assumption was that by doing so, we will increase the enjoyment, social interaction, and presence of the non HMD user. But what we actually found inside of the studies that we had was that um, by including the non HMD users, we also inc um, increased uh, all these like metrics, this enjoyment, social interaction, and presence of the HMD user and the non HMD user. So we started to argue from there on constantly that VR HMDs have to be designed to also fit into the social context that they are, the HMD is going to be used. And here, for instance, they have to be designed to be inclusive and to um, be able to include people in the environment without access to this technology. And um, we continued this line of work. And in the next version, um, we actually said, OK, can we pack, like, can we take share VR and make it completely portable? And the approach that we went for here um, was we said, OK, um, we wanted to build this VR HMD with three displays or with displays. And these displays, they represent the, the projection, so to say. So they help the non-HMD user to understand and see inside of the virtual world. And um, we then started also to design interactions, right? So we had, as you see here, um, uh, let's say gestural interaction where we use the deep motion sensor. And we were able to track the hands of the outside user um, quite well and um, have this like passive, let's say more distant interaction. But we also were interested in, can we include these people now in this physical space? And can we also um, have something like in share VR where we were able to have like haptic interactions with each other? Can we do a similar thing with, um, with uh, face display? So we explored, can we actually start uh, using the screen as a touch display? And can the outside user use this touch screens as well? And they have some form of like haptic feedback here. And um, again, these similar process, multiple iterations of the artifact itself. Um, the user study that we run here um, was um, a little bit interesting. So what we did there is um, we presented the systems to um, groups of people that we recruited. And the, these, these people, they knew each other, right? So they were friends. They, they um, were already right, um, quite familiar with each other. We gave them the system and said, these are two applications. We implemented one with uh, gestural interaction, the one that you see right now. It was a little bit like, um, uh, what's it called? Um, I don't want to call it Beat Saber, but um, it's a little bit in this direction. Um, and the other one, uh, other application that we had was one where we had like this physical interaction. And we were a little scared in the We did not know, oh, how well are people going to perceive this, right? So how, how, how comfortable are they feeling touching each other? And um, the footage that I show you, and I hope you, you're able to see this video is clear. Um, the footage that I show is actually real study footage. So this is what we recorded. These are the participants that we had. And we found that uh, because of this close social um, relationship that they had, they not only like were slightly touching the screen, they started to have way more physical interaction, physical engagement, and they enjoyed it. So that we, we had quite high enjoyment scores in all of the applications that we had. So people had fun using these applications and in particular this type of um, like physical interaction here. Um, so these were two VR systems that tried to address this asymmetric interaction. 
And um, also we did an AR. Um, so this was a work that we did with colleagues in Ulm. Uh, I think we published it last year at WIST. Um, that addresses the same issue, but for augmented reality. Because with augmented reality, there's a similar problematic, right? So if you use a HoloLens, you are the only one seeing the content. So how can we build an HMD that is able to um, share with the environment, with the um, people around you, uh, what it is that you're actually looking at? Um, and the way that we implemented this, we um, attached a projector on a servo motor on top of a HoloLens, and we aligned the images, right? The projected image and the um, image that the user actually sees. And then we used uh, marker tracking to be uh, to enable people in the outside um, to still interact with the digital content. And we explored a little bit um, what type of visualizations make sense, right? So how to distribute information, which parts should be on the augmented reality side, which part should be on the projected side, and um, how to yeah, how to address some of the challenges that we have, for instance, with types of projections, right? So is it going to be a perspective projection, then it only works for one person? Is it going to be an orthographic projection, then it's not exactly the same content and kind of messes with the um, with the perspective of the um, HMD user? But these are all some interesting challenges that arise from such a setup. But the setup itself is addressing this issue of being able to share information, right? So um, if some of you are interested in this topic, we're actually running right now a special issue in Frontiers in Virtual Reality, which addresses exactly this, um, this type of research. Um, the special issue is called um, Asymmetric Mixed Reality, Exploring Interaction and Collaboration with Heterogeneous Mixed Reality Technology. And it's trying to look at, um, okay, um, how can we collaborate and interact in an environment where we have like um, heterogeneous types of technologies, right? Not everyone has access to the same um, type of technology. Now can we have, they have some form of collaboration between. So this was the site that I was talking about that comes from this, this question of how can we shape this technology, right? How can we create it to be desirable and kind of overcome some of the issues? So this was the one side of research that I was uh, mentioning in the abstract and that I mentioned before. And I want to talk a little bit about the different perspective that I'm starting to develop in more and more. And I only going to, uh, let me have a look at the time, I'm only going to briefly um, discuss um, some of the projects here. So the other perspective, um, of research that um, I'm starting to engage with, um, with some colleagues and also in, with the group in telecom, is um, it starts with a different premise. And the premise is not how to make this tech desirable or like usable to, to actually enable ubiquitous mixed reality, but it starts with the premise, well, let's assume it will happen, right? Let's assume we will be able in the future to have constant access to some form of spatial computing device, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, whatever this uh, type of uh, word that you want to use there, but some form of spatial computing um, technology. Um, let's assume we will have this. And if we do this, the interesting question that arises there is now, what potential problems or what potential negative implications could this technology have on us humans, right? And the question for HCI researchers in particular is how can we overcome these? And um, as an example, um, we so these, these potential negative implications are gonna divide into two categories. Uh, one category are unintentional ones, right? So there are some positive, uh, some potential negative implications that are not intentional intent. And we started to explore some of these questions at a workshop at CHI in 2018 in, in, in Glasgow, um, where we um, started to explore challenges of using um, HUDs in shared and social spaces. And we had like, the workshop was divided two parts. The first part we had like, um, we, I think we were a group of 20 researchers. Um, and we were, um, in, in the first step, we were exploring, um, well, we had like multiple talks, we were talking about like potential issues that researchers found. And in the second half of the workshop, we actually started to use this technology in the field, right? So we went outside with, back in the days, there were Oculus Go's and some ARR headsets that we had. Um, and we um, started to explore or use them inside of a pub, inside of a park, inside of like um, a lot of um, different public spaces, just to kind of trying to see, okay, what, what potential issues come there, right? What, what problems can um, arise from these type of, um, of uh, environments that we're going to use them in? And um, in some of the recent projects that we did um, with um, colleagues from Ulm University, 
here in particular, um, Jan Ole, who was the, the, the leading part, um, we started to ask ourselves the following question. Again, the similar premise as I mentioned before, let's assume we will have this access to ubiquitous mixed reality. And we will be able to have, for instance, augmented reality headsets um, that um, can augment like the environment around us, but also another person. So in this research, we ask ourselves, how comfortable are people going to feel if they are on the one hand augmenting inside of a one-to-one -one conversation, if they are augmenting the uh, uh, part in front of them, and also how comfortable they're going to feel if they are being augmented. So I just going to quickly go over this, um, the, the project here. And if you're interested in this, um, you should definitely visit Jan Ode's talk that he's going to have at, um, at CHI 2021 this year. And we're going to explain a little bit in way more detail, like this type of research that we did. But in a nutshell, what we did is we ran this online experiment with 64 people. And um, we asked them, we presented these top right images. So Jan created a bunch of really like um, good looking uh, videos that show or that we used as a tool to um, uh, explain to people, okay, this is the functionality that a future augmented reality headset could have. And then we asked them, okay, what um, would you feel comfortable in augmenting in the partner in front of you? For instance, um, part of the clothes, part of the head, the hands, the arms, the feet, and so on. And we also asked them, how comfortable would you feel if you would have been augmented by the person in front of you? And we found an interesting like uh, gap here in between. So what we found is in the, in the bottom left, you can see like these red um, colors indicate like areas where people um, did not feel comfortable um, augmenting someone else, right? The left person we see is augmenting another one. So people did not feel comfortable augmenting the head or the skin areas of the speaker in front of them. However, when asked if how they feel, how comfortable we feel when they would be augmented, they were kind of fine. They were like, well, kind of indifferent in this degree. So it's, it's okay. So it's an interesting discrepancy that we have. So people do not feel um, comfortable augmenting others, but if they ask if they feel comfortable augmented, they, they're kind of okay with that. But what we also started in this paper, and this is really, so I'm really happy about this part of it, as we started to have this discussion of, um, should we actually have this ability to alter the visual appearance of our conversational partner at all, even if it's only perceived by us? Because we had some participants that started to say, well, it depends on the content, because I would not feel comfortable if the other person would augment me in a really weird or abstract way. But we can actually make the argument to say that, well, but I can do this now already. I can imagine it. Like, I, I don't need to use technology. I can just imagine some form of, of I don't know, um, horrible augmentation. And just because I use technology here, is does it make it like worse or good? Because I'm, we, we constantly talk about, we're not sharing this. It's just for this person itself. And I think it's an interesting question that um, kind of points towards this problem, like this potential unintentional um, harmful application that could arise from ubiquitous mixed reality. And another work that was done um, um, by uh, Teresa, and it's also, um, she's going to present a talk at CHI 2021. So um, uh, if you're interested in all the details about this particular research, you should really join this talk. Um, but what Teresa explored is um, in, in this future when ubiquitous mixed reality headsets are going to be used on a daily basis, what are going to be the main factors of discomfort? And usually what we would think is it's going to be something like simulator sickness, right? This is the largest factor of discomfort. But what Teresa actually found um, is that, um, so we, we run this like online experiment with 350 people. And um, what the and people had to use some form of a reality application, and then they were asked a bunch of questions, right? A set of questions about um, ergonomics, about simulator sickness issues, and about digital eye strain. So there were three types of questionnaires that they applied there. And then we kind of let them rate what, what are the factors that are more relevant for them, and also what are the factors that actually occur. And what we found is that simulator sickness is, in, compared to the other two, is actually the least um, severe symptom here, right? So digital eye strain was significantly more severe compared to simulator sickness. And ergonomics, right? This, this, this wearing of the headsets also affected is more severe than um, simulator sickness. And ergonomics and digitalized are kind of um, similar in the sense. Um, so this starts to, again, think about this unintentional potential negative implications of, OK, what are um, side effects of longer usage of um, augmented virtual reality, actually? 
And um, I want to, so in the last part of this talk, I want to talk a little bit about this intentional part of it, you know, explain a little bit what I mean with that. So um, what we did, and we started to explore this type of intentional negative implications in, um, I think last year we had a Kai workshop and, uh, and the title or the, the topic was um, exploring potential abusive ethical, social and political implications of uh, mixed reality research in HCI. And unfortunately, so we had this wonderful plan of the workshop should be a white hackathon approach and every participant would have to um, create an a uh, potential abuse of application we would discuss and reflect. Um, but because of COVID, unfortunately, we were not able to run this in person. But what we did with um, Sam Hora at Telecom, we actually run a, a smaller version of this workshop. Um, like before, we actually did this as an um, um, example or like as a practice run before we wanted to run the actual workshop. And here you see some of the images. So what we did is we, um, um, we were working with a group of students and we were um, letting the students have a, this design fiction approach of trying to design uh, malicious or negative implications, right? N like things of like abusive types of um, VR applications or AR applications, and then have this reflection um, upon these designs we created and try to think about how could we potentially fix this, right? What what could be something that we can, uh, we can do to mitigate all, all these issues? And the interesting thing is that to enable these negative application scenarios. So I think on the right side, you see students and they like rapidly prototype an AR headset that is able to, um, I think is able to steer your attention to something that the creator um, uh, wants. And the interesting thing is that to enable these types of harmful applications, we were constantly referring to techniques that were presented in the field of HCI mixed reality, right? redirected walking, haptic retargeting, all these wonderful illusions that were used to a beneficial um, aspect were actually used now um, to show, well, I can actually do this and come up with this abuse of an horrible application. And one of the last projects I want to talk about, and I'll only tease it a little bit because this is still research and progress that we're currently doing, is, um, is called VR puppeteering. And what we are trying to do here and is, um, let me show you this video, um, is we look at this particular instances of VR, let's say. So if you start to like look for VR fails on YouTube, you will fee see a bunch of these like really kind of funny or kind of um, like sometimes really dangerous incidents and accidents where people are hitting other people in the environment, where people are colliding with the environment, where people are, um, I don't know, uh, losing balance or um, like stumbling upon um, anything. And the question is, why is this happening? So what is the issue that is going on here? This is something that we try to understand in this. But what we actually want to do is we go, want to go a little bit further. We want to ask ourselves the question, can we, so if, if this works with VR, can we do this deliberately? Are we able to control the actions and movements of a user in VR through some form of HCI techniques, interaction design, and it built actually something like, like this. So can I design an application? And what do I have to do for this? To actually control the user and for instance, deliberately make them run into a wall, deliberately making hit the environment. And um, the question here is that if I can do that, then I think we have a, a, a larger problem with this particular system. At the last step, so this isn't going to be an important one, is um, after we do this, we're trying to propose solutions for this, right? So we want to show, well, we can use HCI techniques to enable this, to do this, but also then start proposing, okay, this is how we could fix it, right? This is how we could try to prevent any of this. Um, so, I want to end the talk a little bit with reflecting upon these two perspectives that I showed to you and question or like just pose this question to the to the audience and like the discussion later on, what, what should the role of HCI be in this uh, future of mixed reality, of ubiquitous mixed reality? And I showed you these two perspectives, right? The one comes from the technological perspective and trying to extrapolate the, the, the structure or the shape of technology and saying like, okay, so this is what uh, we have to overcome to make mixed reality desirable, while the other perspective actually says, well, it will happen, right? We, we, we Sure, we can, we can try to push it, but if we're honest, I, th I think it will happen. And I think the more interesting question there uh, are starting to be like, what could be issues, right? What could be problems of this potential future, this potential exposure to technology? 
And I would argue that there, and this is what I can try to call a little bit, so I'm not too happy with these terms, but it's more like one side is kind of auditing or the other is innovating to some degree. But I would argue that both are actually working towards a similar thing. They try to shape the technology of the future. They try to shape um, mixed reality ad monitor displays or mixed reality technology um, to some degree. And I would even argue that both are applying a similar methodology, right? The methodology I showed you before, some form of implementation of an artifact, then trying to research and understand this artifact um, and the implications of it. And then out of this, trying to make conclusions, say like, okay, we can build, for instance, face touch in this way. It solves this, or it could be one potential solution for this lack of space in uh, mobile VR interaction. This is how, good face touch performs, and this is how we can design applications for face touch, right? And this auditing perspective goes through a similar step. So this VR puppeteering could be like, okay, this is, um, this is again, the, this is how we were able to create an artifact that is able to control people, that is able to um, break out of, for instance, the safety guardians that we have, and then run an experiment again run an experiment, be able to show, well, this is how we did it, right? This, it actually worked with this amount of people and this is one of the issues that we have. And the last, the theoretical part here then is, is a really essential one from this type of research. It actually is proposing solutions. So it's kind of this white hat hacking approach saying like, look, this is what like you propose. We can use these wonderful HCI techniques to break it. This is how we broke it but this is how you could fix it, right? For instance, one of the implications that we're probably gonna have for VR puppeteering is we need to redesign the VR guardian system because it's, it's a really primitive and simple system to protect us. And it can be easily um, be hacked and overcome. So I think my, my last argument is going to be that this, these two perspectives are gonna be both essential and relevant for this future of ubiquitous mixed reality. And we need to go from both directions, right? We not only have to, come up with these innovations or just new interaction techniques and haptic feedback devices. But we also should start to reflect a little bit and start to break some of the stuff that we do. And if it's easily broken, we also should propose like, how can we fix it? Because otherwise you're kind of creating a future, uh, an, like a future environment or a future technology that will maybe run in like quite some some, some issues and troubles again. And I think we can see with um, the the this, example, like the mobile phone that we have, that just creating um, these type of technologies without certain reflections is, is going to be one of the, yeah, it's going to end up in a problematic future. Because I would argue that for this technology, right, the, the most, like, let's say, severe problems that we have with this is actually not how good the touch interaction is, but actually, for instance, something like that the amount of time that we spend on it, right? So this is this, this could be, again, something that we, to some degree, could have been maybe um, expected or prevented. Okay, so all of the all of the work that I showed you, all of these projects were. Um, so I want to thank all of the collaborators. It was all done with um, with people from um, with people from um, telecom, with people from um, all over the world, and all of the projects that are presented were done in collaboration with um, all of these great people that I uh, want to thank here at the end of the talk. And I think I'm done, and I'm happy. Oh yeah, I'm still good in time, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, Jan. So yeah, we're now um, open to questions. If you have any, just raise your hand on Zoom or you could just type it out in chat and I'll just read it out for, for Jan to, um, to answer. So um, is there any, any questions from anyone? Lots of claps here, but no one raising hands. In that case, maybe I will start things off. So I, I really like the um, discussion regarding, or just the idea about ubiquitous AR VR, because actually personally, it was something that I, I also looked into during my um, PhD actually. So, and I remember that when I was looking into Ubiquitous VR, I was also thinking about the challenges faced. Obviously the, the most um, straightforward thing you could say is like the form factor, right? It's, it's big. So the reason why people are still, still not walking around with HMDs is big, it's heavy, it's not really clear. Mm -hmm. And then you discuss about the interaction space, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you, how do you move around in VR so you don't punch someone be beside you, especially in a confined space. And I was also thinking about things like cultural aspects. Maybe there are some limitations in different cultures. And then that led to a lot of thought about privacy as well. And this is something that has been around since maybe even the smartphones or even before smartphones, right? And then there were those glass holes, if any of you remember glass holes. So then th yeah. there could be an equivalent of AR, VR holes, for example, you know, people, people like that. So I was th thinking a little bit about that. So 
I would like you to share, uh, if you could share some, some opinion about the privacy concerns of the use of ARVR in public space. And because I, I think this led to my thought too, because um, just now you, you mentioned a little bit about how people perceive, like if you are perceiving the augmentation of somebody else, um, is that socially acceptable or not? So social acceptance is, is another thing as well. And, and then I was thinking that this, this all is just simply because you have a camera on your face. That's, that's all there is to it, really. Like, you know, if I'm just looking at someone with my eyes, when you said about the imagining thing, right? It's same like I'm just looking mm. at someone with my eyes. No one, ever, no, no one ever said that I was invading their privacy. But the, the moment I have a camera there, then it's invasion. Because I think they're not actually mm. worried about the point of looking or the point of imagining. But the fact that if you have a camera there, there's always a chance it would be recorded. There's always a chance that you mm. could do something with the information later on. Or you could share it with um, social media. You know, there's always a sh social media thing. So, and you look at all these technologies, right? AR, VR. And, and this augmented vision, you will need a camera for that. And so then that becomes a very, at least for now, right, we need to use cameras for this. So then mm. there will always be a concern, in my opinion, at least in terms of this privacy and social acceptance. So maybe is, is there some kind of um, uh, thought that you could share uh, along this line or any ideas you think that mm. could help towards making it more ubiquitous if we're going to rely on such a technology? I think this is a so this is a huge problem that you're addressing here as well, Pine, right? So the, just the fact that uh, where's my quest? Okay, I don't have it here with me, but just the quest itself, it points four cameras on on the environment, right? So I think currently Facebook is not giving um, developers access to this stream or this data. Well, there's a good reason for that, right? There's there's a lot of these concerns that you have. But oftentimes, right, when we do develop some applications. I would love to have it, right? I would love to have this access because you can do even more interesting like applications up on the top of that. Um, I'm unfortunate, I cannot give you any like good suggestions or solution here, right? How, how to deal with this. This, this is really a, a, a tricky, tricky topic. And um, the only thing I can think of is um, um, uh, uh, a good friend of mine and a researcher here in uh, France as well, uh, Marc Tessier. Yeah, he has an interesting, really interesting Kai paper. Again, I'm, I'm making a lot of advertisement for people's Kai papers this year. So the, he has a really good one as well, um, where he addresses this, the way that we design cameras. And in particular, what he, um, so the augmentation that he has is that the way that we design cameras is they're really like small and unobtrusive and really like kind of hiding their existence that they're there. And he's challenging this in a really drastic approach. So he designed this camera that is literally a huge human eye and it's constantly looking at you, trying to kind of give you this awareness of, wait a minute, there's actually, there's actually something looking at you permanently, constantly. Um, how are we addressing this? I'm not sure. Maybe at one point it's going to be something that we are accepting. Mm. I'm not. I, I don't yeah. want. I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, uh, I, I'm. I'm just not sure. Right. This is actually. You know, this I think leading... there's an argument that Facebook does. Right. Right. Yeah. Actually, this is actually leading to my next controversial question. Is that controversial question? Is that do you think people should just learn to accept the fact that there's going to be cameras everywhere in the future, just like how we we now learn to accept that there's this big Google company that knows exactly everything that we want, wherever we are going, um, all our personal preference. We have learned to accept that. Do you think we should just learn to accept that cameras are going to be everywhere around us towards the path of ubiquitous AR VR? Uh, I'm not sure. So <laughs> even that, I, I would even I would even challenge the fact that we should accept that uh, at least this one company has all this access as well. I, I'm not sure if people are trying to accept right. it. This is currently a status quo, yes, but I think there are already quite some people pushing against this. And um, I think one of the issues as well is maybe you're mentioning this is this it's the it's the access of like one particular company having this right so if this is just through google right or just through facebook then i think there's a, like a huge potential for danger and, and misuse mm -hmm. um could there be a way of having this more public domain? I'm not sure. I even thought about an environment. So I had this one thought experiment, one with um, some of my students where we talked about, okay, um, what if this future scenario, what if um, everything would like in the world would be recorded and you would have access to this recording? Like you could see everything, you can watch everything that you want, but also the fact that you watch is something that the person will know. Mm -hmm. How would you like deal with that? So imagine you could, for instance, when I'm like later on gonna go to bed, you could you could watch Jan go to bed, which is weird, but Jan would know that Pi watched Jan. So would Pi watch Jan then? 
right? This complete transparency in this degree. And there's, so the, the thing that we do here is a little bit, we're removing this, this higher power, right? This instance of this one company having this access, but everything being completely transparent. Also the access of people to this particular information would be transparent. Would this solve this? I'm not sure. Would it create a really dystopic future? Could, could really be, I'm, 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 I'm split on this. So this is a, a particular topic that I actually didn't, touch that much, right? This privacy aspect of like always available cameras and even looking at a project, I think that Facebook just announced or um, a while ago announced on um, measuring or like mapping the whole world that they have. I, I don't know what it's called. I think it was called Aero, Aero and something like that. Uh, but I want to use glasses on the Facebook campus and they will um, have employees walk around with this and they will map the whole environment, the whole world that they have around them. Um, yeah, from a developing like perspective, it's it's an exciting thing, right? You you can get access to so much data, you can do fun with it. But from the privacy perspective, it's really spooky and scary. Uh, but I I have no smart answer here. Like I'm not completely sure what we will do with that in the future. Um, great. Uh, is there any other question from anyone? Um, hi, it's Mark here. I have a question. Oh, yes, um, yep. Really great talk, Jan. I really enjoyed it. So I've been impressed with your work since um. You did the uh, first uh, touch screens on the on the um, the head mount displays. Really exciting. Thanks. So um, I'm just wondering if you can tell a bit more about some of the things you learned from those asymmetric interfaces. So, for example, you talked about how um, you know people were encouraged to play more when they were able to touch one person's um, head mount display and then seemed to engage more in physical play. What what happened? What about mm -hmm. with the um, the AR experiences where you had know one person being able to mm. um, see what the other person did you notice any new behaviors um, coming from mm. that or new suggestions for other ways you can enhance those interfaces um so this is a really good point so for the ar one the share um system you're referring to unfortunately this was done perfectly inside like great time inside of COVID, so we did not have user exposure yet. Oh, so the paper in the paper, yeah. we mainly um, explained the system itself and talk a little bit about implications for design there. Um, but we were not able to have a proper user study, which is really interesting to see these dynamics there. Because for VR, I can reflect a little bit what we uh, learned, what we saw is that um, there is a, there's an interesting shift in power dynamics um, that you have, right? The person inside of VR. Um, so we always uh, employed the um, SAM questionnaire, um, self-assessment mannequin, um, where you have like these axes of balance, arousal, and dominance. And uh, the people inside of the VR HMD, they felt less empowered, right? They felt a little bit more, um, how can I say, um, dominated by the outside person in this type of interaction. So I think there's a lot of um, power dynamics based on the content that we have for VR. For AR itself, it's it's still it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question, and we were not able to explore this with the system that I presented. So this mm -hmm. was mainly a, um, a technical contribution and a little bit of a design reflection of like what issues come when you have the mix of projection when you have the mix of um, augmented interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there's a lot of space to explore like these particular dynamics that uh, occur here, right? Mm. That's too bad. Future work, then I guess. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, do we have any more questions? Maybe I'll ask one more. So, um, yeah, so back to the idea of you pick this um, area. I'm going to spam this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned, so it was a lot of interesting uh, things that you showed, but I was wondering if you thought about the idea of how haptics is going to be in public space. So you did a couple of haptics research. You, sh you showed the gyro VR. And mm -hmm. the gyro VR is something that's attached to the HMD for the user to feel mm -hmm. the haptics. So now that you look at ways for asymmetrical visualization, have you talked thought about mm -hmm. asymmetrical haptics or mm -hmm. could you actually leverage the physical space haptics for your VR haptics? I'm sure there are some papers about yeah. that, but maybe you have explored a little bit about it, maybe you share some thoughts about it. Well, let me let me see if I can share this. We actually did, right? So um, we did it in both types of products that we had. Do, 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 let me jump to the slide um, that I had there. Um, slideshow from current slide. Um, share this one again. Optimize the video. There you go. So, oop. there you go. So with Shabby, we actually had one of these systems, like this application later on. With the this, this was one of my favorite ones, uh, with the lightsaber. So first of all, here we have a little bit of haptics, but this one, this one was really, really cool. 
So the, the, the way that this works is that Julian, when you look at the screen itself, Julian sees me as the Star Wars robot. And because we can track the controller, this was an HC5 controller, um, we used, um, or to be fair, um, Eugen, the student that was working, he actually implemented this application. Um, and what he did is he applied inverse kinematics here. So we could reproduce the shape of my body just based from this um, like one arm that I had. And we used this physical rubber swords, right? This, this inflatable swords. And these swords were actually um, creating haptic feedback for Julian. Like for him, it was a lightsaber. And um, he was able to interact with me. So I was this like robot with a lightsaber and he had a lightsaber and I created the haptic feedback for him. But I did not like just like did it as some form of, I don't know. Um, so it was not like the work that um, Lung Pan was working on, like the haptic Turk aspect. It was actually in a, let's say, um, in a more engaging way for me, because for me, this was the way that I interacted with Julian. I didn't see any of the augmentation. I just saw the rubber swords, but I still had fun and were able to um, um, engage and play with them. So this is kind of how we created haptic splits share and faces play a similar approach, right? So here, um, this last application that I showed you, um, the application was that there's a user that is in, in space and um, what the outside user is representing is actually, um, uh, what's it called? Um, asteroid, is it an asteroid or is it a Metroid? So I think there's a difference in where, where they are, but it's, it's some form of space debris that is hitting the HMD, right? So the user will have a, the inside user will have a visualization of a cracked screen, but would also feel the impact because I am the impact, right? I am creating these, um, uh, these impacts on the screen. And you can see the cracks even, like we, we visualize some of the cracks there. So yes, this is an interesting, um, it's an interesting aspect. And I think Lung Pan, um, he explored um, a little bit more of this, of this, like one user creating haptic feedback for the other user, and I think it's a really interesting approach. I'm not sure to what degree it, it, it's it's going to be something that the scales, right? So is this something that I don't know? I'm in a bus and I'm playing an application, and the one next to me, I'm going to ask him, "Oh yeah, can you please, can you can you please be my haptic device?" Yeah, you it's, could like just shine a light there and then like, oh, what's that someone will touch it and then, okay, you got a haptic feedback. <laughs> or kind of lure them to do this. This yeah. is interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, for us, it was more of a side product that we had from this asymmetric um, interaction, but it was never the focus on there. Okay, um, do we have any more questions from anyone? Maybe I'll just like to discuss a little bit about some of the um, potential limitations that you faced during some of this um, prototypes that you made some of this research. So for mm. example, um, looking at like say the face display that you showed, as well as the share one, the one with the projector on the head. So it's clear that uh, obviously this is just initial prototypes, but just want to talk a little bit about the limitations that you face. I'm sure they are, they're pretty heavy. I think during the study that you showed, it was even like tethered to the rooftop uh -huh. when people was trying to, you know, something like that. So, um, uh -huh. so I'm, I suppose you got some feedback regarding the comfort of the device. Maybe do you have anything to share uh, about how this can be improved. So that's that's one thing. And secondly, the, the second limitation is that like the projector on the head as well as the share VR where you have projection. So by relying on projection, mm -hmm. obviously you can make them work outdoors. I'm, I'm sure the context that you develop is for indoors application. So in the case of outdoors, mm -hmm. then can you see any, any ways to um, circumvent this? Mm, this is interesting. I mean, I mean, for the first one, the um, the ergonomics is something that yes, we struggled with a lot, right? With faces, but it was so heavy. I, I can't even remember, like more than a kilo, and we we had this suspended from the roof um, with a or like from a from a construct that we have above it, um, where we just tried to get some weight of the of the nose, and we even had a lot of padding in the HMD, right? We added additional cushioning, additional padding, just to not um, like torture the users, but also with gyro VR, this was also like. Really happy. The first version that I had with all three um, flywheels, and I could actually stack. So the the way that they are built is quite simple. It's it's old hard drives, right? So it's a mode of old hard drives and just the uh, the actual discs of a hard drive. So I could like modularly extend them and create more weight for more force. So one of the first systems was incredibly heavy and was forcing um, the uh, my friend Pre to wear this and to try it out, and he was suffering and he was annoyed by that. Um, so I mean. As I said, for us, it was, um, and you mentioned rightly, for us, it was a research prototype. So we tried to create it as ergonomic as possible to go through a study, 
is this something you can wear for, I don't know, an hour tops? Yes, you can. Okay, that's, that's fine. Well, you, the user's gonna go through this. Um, how to do to solve these ergonomic issues? This is something I, I hope that Facebook and Microsoft are like heavily working on, because as uh, as I showed the work that um, Teresa was working on, the, like the ergonomics is gonna be one of the large uh, factors for this comfort, right? So it's gonna be one of the larger factors, even larger than some latest things. So this is an issue to to be solved in the future. Um, about the projections that you uh, talked about, this is. So even for the video recording of the of Share VR, we struggled with like how can you record like well like well record um, uh, projected interfaces and to work for the outside this is really tricky. So I think uh, maybe you mentioned that Enrico is going to have the talk next week. Maybe he can reflect some of the early projects he did. He did a lot of work in, mm. in projected interfaces, and I remember one of his um, yeah, one of his earlier PhDs, um, Christian Christian Bintley, he was working on systems that were trying to enable some form of like mobile projection systems that you can mm. carry around the project on the floor but i think uh, they're also struggled a lot with um well with f fighting the sun right i mean how much right. how much lumen or how much lux does the sun have and you have to compete with this this is um so most of this project research is probably gone indoors i mean i think there's quite some interesting work um where um it's actually from japan i can't remember the name of the research working on but it's this mid-air like um i think uh, fairy dust was uh, was it fairy dust? Or I think it was Yoichi, Yoichi Ai or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where he tried to have this alternative ways of projecting in mid air, which is quite cool, interesting. But this is, uh, I mean, I think there's still far, uh, far in the future. Mm. But this could be a potential um, alternative to using these type of projectors, right? Having some mm. form of, of yeah, more right. advanced projection technology. Okay. Um, maybe one more question. Anybody? Pretty quiet crowd today. Maybe it's too early for everyone. <laughs> well, in that case, maybe we I'll have a just... nice discussion pie. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll I actually I still have one more question then. <laughs> if there, if, no, <laughs> if nobody has any, so you you brought forward the the work done by Teresa regarding the the SSQ study, which I think she's here actually. Mm -hmm. Hi, Teresa. Um, so I have some questions about that. So I I think that you you guys did the study remotely, right? I think it's because of COVID and all that it was done remotely. So I was wondering mm -hmm. how 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 was the remote study done? Since it's about the SSQ study, so I I expected that you know for that you would need people to actually put on the device and have some experience in VR to actually judge whether SSQ has any uh, like similar signals has any strong effect or not. Um, because mm -hmm. I think if you I think you you mentioned like you did like three hundred participants online, something like mm -hmm. this. So I imagine that if I were to just answer a question online, I might, like, if I don't have any experience in ARVR, I would just say that eh, it should be fine. But then if I put to try it on and put some, play an ARVR game that requires a lot of turning and moving around, I may feel sick and then my perception might change, my perspective might change. So maybe mm. some feedback on how the study was done uh, regarding that. I think it was kind of interesting. So again, here uh, a shameless plug for the talk. The, Teresa is going to talk about this all in detail at the uh, Kai presentation she has. And uh, I think one of the like clever tricks that she was doing is she was using a platform called Prolific. So it was like online recruitment of um, participants. And the way that she recruited was a clever approach. She recruited people that already had a VR to be used on a daily mm. basis. So the intention here was like, okay, you already use this, right? How often do you use it? And people said, like, oh, I use it, I don't know, um, once a week or something. And then she said, okay, after your last longer play session, like after the next one hour or something that you spent inside of VR, can you please answer these questions? Um, and so we had a, um, uh, or she was able to collect a sample that was more, um, how can I say, um, uh, external valid, right? So people okay. played the stuff that they played right. and then they had to fill out the questionnaire. And this is mainly the like three okay. particular okay. types of questions that mm -hmm. she had. And this is how she was able to record. Or, or All right, so things. that means the sample, sample is basically experienced AR VR users in, in this case. Yeah. So the people that are having yeah. their own in HMD, they use this on a like mm -hmm. regular basis to some degree. And after the last session, we um, we just asked them, okay, can you please fill this out? Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, Teresa had like this a little bit more complex analysis going to explain uh, where she found like, okay, what was this more? What of these factors actually happened? Like what right. of these uh, particular symptoms um, occurred? And which of them are were rated by the users of more severe or more relevant? And mm -hmm. this was interesting to see that some latest sickness as like the whole community of um, like um, ARVR researchers oftentimes focusing so heavily on simulator sickness. This is right. this big discomfort issue. Um, but the study showed that it's actually not the, the most dominant one in mm. the, the, mm. the people in the field, which is quite cool. 
Yeah, well, she said her mic is not working, so maybe I'll we'll just wait for her Kai twenty twenty one talk, and we'll see how it goes. All the best, Teresa, yeah. for the talk. <laughs> Great. Um, so if there are no more questions from anyone, I suppose we'll end the seminar here. So thanks again, Yan, for sharing your work with us, as well as everyone here who is willing to be up early or late to join this this talk, or maybe somewhere in the middle, hopefully. Um, so thanks again to everyone for, for joining us and do look forward to the next seminar coming within two weeks' times. So I think Yen spoiled it already. It'll be by Enrico. But I'll share more <laughs> details about it um, later on and on our Facebook page as well. So take care, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. All right. See you Bye -bye. guys. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye.